welcome back, everyone, to this episode of the Superhero Ethics Podcast. I'm Matthew. I'm one of your hosts. Um, and I'm really happy today uh, because, as you guys have probably noticed, Paul hasn't been able to join us as often. Um, uh, he's getting some living stuff sorted out. And once he does, uh, he's going to be back on as a somewhat regular co-host. But uh, Jacob, who was a, a guest of mine very recently, has, off, has also agreed to be uh, our other regular co-host. And uh, so Jacob is going to be joining me for a number of episodes, including this one today. Uh, so Jacob, uh, welcome uh, to your first time as co-host. Thank you, Matthew. I'm uh, really excited and hope people value my contributions. And if they don't, I'll be happy to read the comments. Yes, definitely, definitely. Um, well, th thank you so much. And, and this is, uh, I know, a topic you and I both care about a lot. Uh, we're going to be talking today uh, about doxing, and specifically the doxing of Nazis. Um, and, and we'll be talking even about that term itself. And for anyone who doesn't know what I mean by that, um, we're, uh, we want to place this in context. And, and we'll definitely be talking this about um, – in terms of uh, our superhero stories and asking how superheroes would handle a situation. But the, the discussion today comes out of the real-world situation that has been being talked about quite a lot recently. Um, as most folks know, um, just a couple weeks ago, there was the, uh, a rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, um, that had uh, uh, quite a lot of Nazi imagery and not, uh, Nazis taking part and white supremacists and the like. And one of the things that happened in the immediate after that, aftermath of that event was um, a number of uh, activists online, including some people from the organization Anonymous or from other sort of pretty strong anti-fascist organizations, um, basically went through the footage and they found pictures of the people who'd been at that march and at that rally. And they started doing internet research and finding out um, you know, public information about these people and using it to, to try and bring consequences to them. Um, and we had some some really great incident. Or it was what I would I would uh, say as as some pretty great things in terms of people losing their jobs or, or being publicly shamed for being um, uh, outed as, as it were as Nazis. Um, other people I know have looked at that and been very troubled by it. Um, uh, and as well as there have been some some problematic things in terms of people being misidentified and the like. Um, and, and, and given that, and especially given those the the use of those tactics that we've also seen being used in in really horrifically problematic ways. That's how that term doxing itself comes to us. Uh, Jacob and I thought this would be a really interesting topic to dive into because it, again, this is one that's grounded in our own real world, but it, it goes into so many of the discussions and, and, and decisions that superheroes have to make all the time in terms of everything from what kind of methods do you use to fight evil like Nazism in the world to when do you work within the law or step outside the law to issues of collateral damage and whether that's a acceptable thing. Um, so I, I think this is a topic, Jacob, I, I'm really excited for us to dive into. And and I want to start by, by just asking that question of the term doxing. Is that one you think that's an appropriate term to use for the, the situations we're talking about of, of outing Nazis uh, when they go to rallies and then having there be consequences when that information is shared? Doxing itself is not necessarily supposed to be a, a a negative thing. We take it as a negative because usually when we're when we're seeing it happen to somebody or when we're hearing about it happening to somebody, uh, it's uh, the the person who's doxing them is doing it out of some kind of, for lack of a better way of putting it, some some selfish reason. They're doing it uh, to try to to get an edge on them, or they're doing it trying doing it to try to get revenge, get back at somebody. Uh, so to, to give, the, I, I think most of the time that I first heard the term was used was um, during GamerGate and other things like that. Yes, when, yes. Um, especially women were often, um, you know, raising real concerns about the misogyny in the video game industry or other parts of the geek world, and the response was to try to attack these women by releasing, you know, their home address so that they could be harassed, um, private information, things like that. Right, and and in that sense, yes, that that's that's malicious doxing right that's that's somebody who or people who are doing this and their intent is just to bring somebody else down not because of what that person is doing they see as as being problematic for our society at large which is the distinction i'm attempting to make but because they personally don't like it mm. uh and so i think that that's that's a distinction at least for me that that i draw between uh, these two different type, types of actions and why I think they're they're not quite the same thing. Like I don't – I would not parallel uh, the releasing of public information of the people who went out and marched with torches and shouted Nazi slogans in Charlottesville. Uh, I would not compare the outing of them uh, in that public venue to the outing of people who are trying to advocate for um, 
better representation of women in video games and what and some of the problems with uh, the rep- representation of women in video games in the video game industry. Like right. those those are complete not the same thing to me. It, it's interesting. I think I think I, I think I agree with you about seventy five percent in that, and and certainly I think uh, from my perspective, certainly I think they're very different. Um, as well as I think there's a big difference between what we've been seeing in the wake of the Nazi march of revealing public information so that employers can know your employees are a Nazi or that's so that parents can know your child is a Nazi um, and that consequences can happen. To me, that is very different than the release of private information like a home address specifically for the point of harassment. No, no that, absolutely, absolutely. As soon as you start getting into information that's not – in in the public venue, or you had to you had to go digging for it. Right. Uh, that takes on a completely different uh, connotation as well. The the one area though where I think I'd want to push back a little bit, and I, I think this is something we're going to get into because it is is uh, like you you know I I completely agree with you that to me there's there's a, a a fundamental difference in part because you know to me Nazism is is a a categorical evil and a, a clear bad thing in a way that you know working for the advancement of women in the video game industry is, is absolutely not. But I think we need to be careful to not be to not start saying to not equating the fact that we agree with the motives of one and the other and to therefore say that one is selfish and the other is not because I do think it's important to understand that the um many of those who've been doxing the women journalists and the like certainly many I think you're right are coming at it from a completely just uh ridiculous selfish perspective for some it is because what they believe is that they're working to protect the video game industry i i 100 let me finish i I 100 percent disagree with that but i just think that's important because i think as we're going to get into and this is an issue i know that comes up so often for the heroes we talk about that the fact that you believe you're doing the right thing it's just so easy to to let you know so often you can believe you're doing the right thing for the right reasons and still be categorically wrong I would actually uh, argue that probably the vast majority of people who are doing that think they fall on that side, that their their mindset is that what they are doing is for some greater purpose. Because as, as we discussed the last time I was on, people in general have some degree of empathy and don't take actions that are that, – that we would perceive as, as monstrous, right? So right. There, there's some – However misguided, there's some higher motive, I think, that the, these people are having they're using to justify uh, the actions that they're taking. Uh, one of the reasons this is a good topic to talk about on this cast is because what what we're discussing, what we're the, the moral dilemma we're talking about, uh, heroes in various forms of media have to face them constantly. We see lots of examples of mm-hmm. heroes facing these kinds of questions of, do I do this thing that in a vacuum, I don't think is morally okay, but in this specific example, I truly believe that what I am doing would be right because it helps fight this person. But do I still do it? And sometimes they fall on one side of the, yes, okay, I'm going to do this because I I need to fight the bad. And other times, like, no, I have to find a better way. I can't sink to that level. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point. I know um, when you and I were planning this, one of the examples we we, we both looked at is the TV show Daredevil, um, and mm-hmm. that that character, especially because I, the, the um, you pointed out, I thought I thought rightly so that that Matt Murdock basically winds up using this tactic halfway through that TV show, um, through that story against Wilson. In season one. Yeah, in season yeah. one, yeah, thank you. Uh, against Kingpin, you know that one yep. of his attempted actions is to, um you know, go public and try to reveal who this person is publicly and connect that, the public persona to the private person. Which, which interestingly is how Matt Murdock ultimately defeats uh, Fisk, at least in season one. Yeah. Uh, nothing else he tries actually works. He tries to do the, you know, take the fight to them uh, and, and, you know, be physical and try to interfere with plans and stuff. And But really the only thing that ends up actually shutting Fisk down is getting him exposed yeah. to the public, getting and, his actions, getting what he's doing exposed. And, and I think it, to me that's so interesting because, yeah, you're right, it, it, it works in that way. But it, but it's also such an interesting flip because and, – and granted, the, the Marvel Cinematic Universe has somewhat gotten away from the, the whole secret identity question. Um, but, but for a lot of comic book history and even for some of the Marvel and certainly a lot of the DC stories, often one of the things that our heroes most fear is themselves being doxxed. You know, 
someone mm-hmm. revealing that Spider-Man is Peter Parker. Someone re- even in the um, most recent TV show Defenders, uh, this is not a big spoiler by any means, but Matt Murdock is very concerned of people realizing that that he, Matt Murdock, is is Daredevil. Um, right. So and interestingly, it, he's the only one of that crew that still has that concern. But they all, sh- but but it's demonstrated very early on why they all should. Right. Absolutely. So so I want to start by asking, um, just in kind of in terms of our superheroes, who 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 we think would or wouldn't wouldn't use these kind of tactics. Again, I'm I'm looking for a better word besides just doxing. Um, but who who are the ones you think you can think of who who would say no? I'm not I'm not going to do something like that. I'm not going to try and uh, get the, that kind of private information and then share it about about someone who's doing wrong. Well, I think uh, the biggest example, the world, the uh, universe's biggest Boy Scout, Superman, yep. right? Like he always so, so Superman is a character who's uh, in a lot of ways and in, in most media where he's portrayed, he's defined by his uh, ridiculously strong, quote unquote, moral center, right? right? Where there's just he, he has a line that he will not cross. I find the most interesting. Uh, this is why one of the reasons I actually find the character of Superman most of the time boring. But the times where he's interesting is when he actually wrestles with that and, yeah. and doesn't necessarily come down on the side of it. But most of the time, I think that he just immediately rejects ideas like I, I don't have to sink to that level. I don't have to do things. Well, I mean, he also is indestructible and can fly and has laser vision and stuff, right? Like, he has he has tools available to him is the point I'm attempting to make that we do not and that yes. other heroes do not. So it's very – it's easier, I would argue, for him to reject these ideas, to reject these tactics as unnecessary. Although, again, I think that if he tried it, he might be able to – like, he's trying to catch Lex Luthor in the act. Yeah. Right, but what he's not trying to do is like gather a whole bunch of intel on Luther behind this behind the scenes as a journalist, as Clark Kent, and then throw it out in the Daily Planet's paper, you know, page one, page two, and and trying to get him that way. I, I mean, I think there, there's um, you know, some of my favorite stories, even though I I and here I, I get my Zack Snyder dig in quick. Um, <laughs> as much as I hated Batman vs Superman, actually obliterated ex- Zack Snyder dig. <laughs> exactly. As much as I hated Batman vs Superman, I think the tension between those characters is so interesting, particularly around this issue, because Batman's the opposite. Batman is the detective. Batman would absolutely, you know, release this kind of information oh, he, if he could. Oh, he one hundred percent would. I don't even think he would hesitate. I think he'd be like, oh. I, I know who this person is outside of their ridiculous uh, costumed villain persona. Right. Great. Let's <laughs> let's get that out there so people know so that they can't do things. So like his thought process there, I think, would be so that they can't do things in their plain clothes outfits or in, in their plain clothes uh, persona. Right. To to help themselves like it forces them into their little rabbit hole and they can go dig them out. Well, and just staying on Superman for one more second, I, I think. Um, you, I think you're right about him being the Boy Scout, and, and to me, one of the things that I find both problematic about the character of Superman, but very interesting when the authors are actually willing to explore this as not always a good thing, it is to me, he is someone who really highlights the differences between being moral or being ethical, you know, yeah. in that he is someone who, he has a rigid set of rules that he follows, and I think one of those rules would be like, you, you fight people fair, and, and mm-hmm. boxing isn't a way to have a fair fight. And and Superman, I think, when when the story is told well, can often illustrate the real problems of that kind of like rigid ethical structure of instead of being able to look at like, well, actually, how are people being able to abuse that secrecy and, and get away with terrible things? You know, he, he is going to have his rules and he's going to stick to them, you know, come hell or high water. Mm-hmm. And, and I think this is a great as we're going to get into. This is a great example of where that can get kind of problematic. Um I, I think to me, someone else who I, I think, again, would also have similar problems with it for similar reasons, um, though maybe with a little more bend to him as Captain America. Definitely. In, in many ways, I feel I find him a more interesting character, but I feel like in many ways he is Marvel's Superman in that he is the Boy Scout. You know, he's the one who, who gets people to, to, to not use bad language when they're fighting Hydra, of all yep. things. You know, and he I think he's very dedicated to the idea of he just wants to punch the bad guys until they stay down. He doesn't want to use these other kind of methods. But he doesn't have nearly the capacity for other weapons, other tools at his disposal that Superman does, which I think is part of what makes Captain America a more interesting character. He kneecaps himself on what he's willing to do to fight his enemies. Um, 
because he's choosing to take a moral stance instead. Right. Um, who who else would you say would you put on that list of, of folks who probably wouldn't use this kind of tactic? Well, I mean, we uh, we argued about this. Uh, well, I guess we I guess we could talk about uh, another member of the um, of the Avengers uh, in Thor. Mm -hmm. And I think in in this way, and I'm not trying to be cute with my word choice here. I think that just the concept would be very alien to Thor. Yeah. Uh, because that like where he comes from, the the culture that he comes from, that's again not how you fight your enemies, and he he wouldn't care. People release his personal information. Well, his personal information is in fact, yeah, I am this guy from from Asgard. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's me, son of Odin. <laughs> what up, like? So, like, it wouldn't do anything to him, and he wouldn't – I don't think he uh, – especially if he's um, not been on Earth for a while, I don't think he would understand how it would be effective in the first place for the kinds of enemies Thor is usually fighting. No, and, and I think <clears> – <throat> excuse me. That's actually a really good point that I hadn't thought of till now is that p part of what I think a character like Thor would help us see is that this is a very particular kind of attack on someone You know, that only makes sense when – I don't know we're going to get into this specifically later, but you know, it, the whole point of it, when we're, when we're using it from the perspective of exposing this so that other people see who you are, shame has to be a factor. You know, so yeah, fear of social stigma has to be a factor in a way that for Thor, that's pretty much irrelevant. Yeah, the, the, the person who's being doxxed has to be socially vested for the tactic to be effective in the first place. If they're not socially vested, it doesn't matter. Right. And so Thor would be like, whatever. Uh, Superman wouldn't care unless it was his Clark Kent information that's coming out. Uh, Captain America, he has nothing to hide. Right. And that's a point I like. he makes himself that I have nothing to hide. But, you know, that's because he's little boy perfect. Right. So. <laughs> uh, and I know there, the, the one other one that I would put on the list of, of folks who probably wouldn't do this is Danny Rand. Um, you know, and, and there, there to me, it's more about the naivete of that character. Um, right, and and I would argue, uh, and we talked about this a bit beforehand, but I would argue that Danny Rand would be convinced. Uh, mm. I think some of the people that that Danny Rand w ends up working with, and when you look at the Defenders, uh, very early on, we're going to spoil some things about the Defenders. So if you haven't watched <laughs> the new show, I think it's worth watching. It's way better than Iron Fist. Uh, so go ahead and watch it. Yep. Uh, but um, hey, you get to see Jessica Jones and, and Matt Murdock and, and Luke Cage, and I love those characters. So And, and anyway. watching them all kick Danny Rand around makes the Danny Rand character almost watchable. Yeah, and, but, it, and it's not, it's not, yeah, not dogpiling on him either, but yeah. moving on. on. Uh, yeah. <laughs> at one point, Danny Rand is uh, sitting down and having a conversation with Luke Cage after they've gotten their testosterone poisoning out, poisoning out of them and are actually having a conversation, um, which takes a spell, as you uh -huh. might imagine. Um uh, Danny and, and Luke are having an argument uh, where Luke's like, like, you can do other things. You don't have to just, like, punch people in the face. You have access to things I don't. And Danny Rand's like, I'm not going to do that. But then he thinks about it later after the argument is done, and he decides that Luke's got a point. Mm -hmm. And he goes and he tries to use uh, his business and his connections to fight the hand, uh, which doesn't work out very well, but he's convinced. He so like again, I think that initially you're right that he wouldn't he wouldn't even consider it as a thing that he would do. That's not honorable, right? For him, it's not a fair fight. Uh, it's a similar kind of thing to Cap, where it's like okay, mano a mano, uh, may the best person win, mm -hmm. and that's like. In Danny Rand's case, he, he is in fact rather naive, uh, but it also has to do with his upbringing. Right. Uh, but as soon as he's exposed to the idea that you know, this is just another tool in the toolbox, then I think it'll click for him, and he'll be all like, "Yeah, you use every weapon. Yeah. You use every tool in the toolbox." I I I think that I think that's a definite possibility, and I admit there's a part of me that just wants to say that you know anything bad I'm always going to put on the Danny Rand camp because I just have <laughs> such negative opinions of that character. There, but, there are better portrayals of that character, but they exist in comic form, so you probably right. need to look at those. Well, but I, but I do think you're right that and, 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 and that that he is one who maybe could be convinced. Um, mm. And so who's on, who's on the other side? Who do you think would be the folks who would be most uh, of our our heroes, superhero and sci-fi and the like? Who, who, who do you think of would be top of the list trying to convince Danny Rand? 
my my favorite if if they existed in the same universe my favorite example of this is not batman mm -hmm. it's malcolm reynolds right uh, so captain mal from firefly uh and i think that he's, he's a great example of somebody who like he doesn't always make decisions that we would associate with the you know strong moral hero who does everything right and doesn't ever um doesn't ever do anything illegal or questionable. Malcolm Reynolds is doing questionable things like every other day, mm -hmm. if not every day. But he's he does have a, a code that he lives by, and he's but he's still willing to use tools like this to attack his enemies. I like look what he does in Serenity when he actually comes up against something that is a an evil to his entire world, which in this case is a you know a universe spanning multiple worlds. He finds an evil that he Thing else is unconscionable and what does he do he's like this has to go public right. we have to throw this out we have to throw the um the alliance into the public light and show everybody what they did because right. this isn't okay and, and i do think i i want to I, I think one little distinction i think it's important to make is that we're not just talking here about just revealing like cause I think, uh, revealing bad things people do you know because i think even there mm -hmm. like you know in um uh, 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 Winter Soldier, you know, Captain America, you know, sheds the public light on what Hydra is doing. I think even Superman would do that kind of thing. Right. We're, we're talking about even going a, a step further than that into really trying to use shame and, and public knowledge as a weapon. Um, but, I, but I think you're right that, that that's absolutely the kind of thing Mal would do, especially because it, 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 it seems to me that for most of those other, most of the characters who are on the other side, they're starting from a perspective of like on, on some level, I think to be against it, you have to have a perspective of the way our world works at least makes some fundamental sense. And this is kind of breaking a social tab. It's breaking a social taboo. It's breaking a social right. rule. Malcolm, right. it, it seems like th one of the things that comes up for him so often is his idea of the way that the world works actually is pretty fundamentally broken. And, mm -hmm. and I think he's someone who really gets the idea that you know, playing by the rules the way a Superman would want to, what, that actually benefits the kind of people who are always screwing Malcolm. Yeah. And so in, in a case like that, in, in Malcolm Reynolds' case, uh, his enemies are going to do it, so he's absolutely going to do it if he ever gets access to it. We never see him doing something quite like this mm -hmm. in the series, but we do see him making decisions that are, I feel... From from a strict moral perspective, I don't feel are correct, but he does them anyway. In, in the early scene of Serenity, where he shoots somebody off of their hovercraft because it's going to weigh it down when they're trying to get away from the the reavers, right? Like, and you know his his uh his compatriots call him out on it, but he seems to be pretty happy, or not happy, but he seems to be pretty okay with that decision. Because at the time, it's what he felt needed to be done. I, I mean, to me, I, I, yeah, I think you're right there. One, one of the other things that I think of in, the, in this context for Malcolm is uh, in the first episode of Firefly, um, when uh, he, he, uh, he's going up against the character Patience, I think her name is, uh, the older mm -hmm. woman, uh, and, he, and he shoots the horse. Yep. You know? Because, again, that's the kind of thing where, like, you know, Superman, Captain America, these are people who are going to do everything they can to protect all the innocent life around them. Um, and not that I'm by any means, you know, advocating violence against animals, um, such as horses. But uh, but I think Malcolm in that situation, he's sort of saying like, it's not that he hates horses and wants to kill a horse. It's that he recognizes he's trying to protect his team, he's trying to protect his family, he's trying to protect himself. This is what's necessary to get done. Um, and he's trying to get his payday. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, his, his motives are mm -hmm. not just purely altruistic, but he has a certain sense of he's willing to get his hands dirty in that regard. Yep. Yeah. Um, and we talked about Batman. I think Batman definitely in that same regard. Um, you know, Batman's whole story is about being willing to get his hands dirty to do the right thing, to do what's necessary. Um, is there anything else, anyone else you'd put on, on, on this in that kind of like uh, heroes you think would definitely be on the doxing side? Uh, heroes that would definitely be on the doxing side. I'm, I was struggling to, to come up with uh, – oops, sorry with, – uh, with some examples that uh, – because generally speaking – in our media, we are given – it's funny. We're, we're given heroes more often than not that are supposed to be these paragons that we look up to. And we look up to them because they make the hard choices, but they always fall on the, quote, right side of things. Uh, I hear that Oliver Queen 
in his portrayal in the Arrow series is an example of this. And that, I recall correctly, would track from the kinds of things he does in the comics as well. Mm -hmm. But I haven't seen the DC show, and I don't know a lot about Green Arrow, so I don't actually know if that's something that character would do. Yeah, From I mean, what I heard, I expect he would. I, I think he is an example of, for the most part, the show is not terribly consistent all the time in a way that's a little frustrating to me sometimes. But um, one of the things that I really like so much about the char about the show Arrow, uh, and we talked about this with a, a great podcast I did a couple weeks ago with J.P. Fairfield, um, is that um, he's Arrow probably would be very happy to dox someone who he thought was doing wrong. But he, he, if there's any hero I could imagine who would accidentally dock someone and later find out that they weren't actually the right person, it would probably mm -hmm. be Arrow. You know, he's – there's a number of examples where – and I think I, – I mention that because I think that's one of the real dangers we have to talk about is that this is a, this is a, a weapon that can go wrong very easily, both right. in terms of um, hitting an innocent person by accident or just doing it for the wrong reasons or the like. And, and Arrow is definitely a, a good example of a character who a lot of times can talk himself into believing something is the right and moral thing, and, and really he's just serving his own desire to, you know, hurt the bad guy. Right. And speaking of Batman, uh, somebody else that would, uh, because we saw it uh, in Mask of the Phantasm, the Phantasm, mm -hmm. um, that's a good example of, of this practice being used in a way that that's not okay but being justified by the character uh for much the same reasons that we would try to justify it to ourselves in in the case of the people who marched in charlottesville right yeah i think the phantasm is a great example of of and this is actually a good good transition because i wanted to talk about what are sort of some of the specific problems with with this is um, you know, and this is obviously a theme that comes up so often in in this show and, and, and these questions. But is you know, once you're starting to go down the road, uh, r route, uh, starting to go down, sorry, once you're starting to go down the road of vigilantism, this question of you know, are you actually working for something that could be identified as justice versus are you just trying to get revenge? Um, right. Are you just trying to hurt people because you don't like what they're doing? Um, and Arrow, I think, is definitely in that camp. And I think you're right. Phantasm is another really example of someone for whom, it, you know, it, it crosses the line away from justice into just pure revenge. And I think we would be lying to ourselves if we if we said that or kidding ourselves, at least if we said that everybody who released uh, information about the the people who marched uh, were was doing it for. No reason other than uh, nothing but altruistic yeah. reasons, right? That that most likely part of the reasoning is that I do not agree with what these people are doing. The fact that I happen to agree with the people who did this, who who did the uh, the release of the information, doesn't actually sanction the action, right? Well, and so that's yeah. Go on. Let, let's go deeper on that because I think this is such a key issue for for this question and for heroes in general. I mean, I, there's a part of me. You know, I hate that Nazism is a thing in America again. I can't believe it. And I, I, I hate it on a justice level. I hate it on the fact that I'm half Jewish and I'm, I'm personally afraid. And I just think it is fundamentally wrong. And, and whatever justice claims I can make, there is a visceral part of me that feels good when I hear about a Nazi suffering, when I hear about mm -hmm. a Nazi getting punched, when I hear about a Nazi losing his job. When I hear about a Nazi, and I'm, I'm mostly using he because it's mostly what it's been, but, but not exclusively. Um, but when I hear about a Nazi, you know, having their parents reject them because they find out they're a Nazi. Th there's a visceral part of me that just feels good. What, what's wrong with that? Why, why is that problematic for, for that visceral feeling to be what drives heroic behavior? Well, the, well. Or is it? Okay, Maybe the, it's not. The, the... The the feeling itself is is not what we would traditionally classify as heroic, right? You're t you're taking pleasure in someone else's misery, yeah, right. I'm pretty sure like everyone can agree that that's uh, something that we've defined in all of our media as as a villainous thing. When when you're you're happy because they're suffering, we've we've said that that's bad. Um, but like, does that mean that? We're not supposed to rejoice when the Death Star blows up. Mm. Like a bunch of people died when that happened, right. right? And yeah, they're on the wrong side of of this conflict. Uh, we we like they 
they blew up planets. Like that's not okay. But like there's you know there, there's people in that Death Star that maybe didn't have a hand in that decision. Right. But I who sees that event in Star Wars and doesn't like just feel joy, feel you know elation. Yes, we did it. They right. they got him. It's the it's the climax. It's the heroic climax of the movie. Um, and, everything and, worked out. And that's very intentional. The movie tells you that story in a way yep. where when you when you see the Death Star blow up, you're not thinking about, you know, Joe the plumber who's working on the Death Star toilets. You're thinking about mm -hmm. the evil jackbooted stormtroopers who are literally faceless and don't seem human. They just seem like, you know, the embodiment of evil. Right. And in this case, uh, there's, a, there's a parallel, I feel, that can be drawn because in, in – our perspectives, when we see things like this, we don't think there's any kind of moral ambiguity. We see this as evil. Right. And we don't want evil in our society. So when we hear about people that are doing evil things, suffering, we feel good about it. Is that the same thing? As, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure that is the same thing as, as uh, feeling happy when somebody's writhing in agony under right. the Cruciatus curse, for example, in, uh, in, in Harry, Harry Potter. Potter. Yeah. Right. I don't think that's necessarily on the same level, but it's still if if we wanted to be moral paragons like Superman, right? If we wanted to to hold ourselves to that level, uh it would still would not be okay. It should be something that bothers us. Uh I feel it's not realistic to hold oneself to that standard. Mhm. Mm so I, oh, I it's something that oh sorry. No, I have a little bit more to say. No, go for uh, it. Uh so I think that being able to ask the question of yourself, being able to say, hmm, is it really okay that I feel that, shows enough self-awareness that you're probably all right. If you're taking the time to go, you know what, maybe I shouldn't be feeling good about this, you're acknowledging that your your own feelings in this are problematic, and then maybe you spend some time justifying them, but at least you're asking the question. At least you're you're being aware that there's a problem, which hopefully will help you catch it when it is not actually – when it's something that, that does cross that line. So I, I definitely hear what you're saying, and here I think there's a, there's a really good debate to be had. And, and I admit it's a debate that I have because I – even here, like I am I'm, – I think mostly in favor of the doxing of Nazis. But, it, but there's a part of me that, that wrestles with it, and, it, and I think more than anything it's because of this question right here. And it's because and, – and this is – what I like about stories like Mask of the Phantasm and, and Arrow when it's on point on this and some of the other hero stories we get, um, Matt Murdock, I think, actually really talks about this, where <clears throat> the, you can tell yourself that there's this line between am I doing this because I feel good fighting the bad guys or am I doing this because, as you said, there's a way to justify it, and that, yes, it's really important to ask yourself that question, but it's also really easy to convince yourself of the answer to that question. You know, I mm -hmm. one of my absolute favorite moments in season one of Daredevil that I think gets to the heart of so much of this character and, and, and this whole question we're talking about, um, <clears throat> and granted, he's talking about it in terms of doing physical harm, not social harm, but I think the question is the same, is when he's talking to his priest and he's saying that, like, he, he doesn't like the fact that he has to do harm to someone like Fisk, but he thinks it's necessary... And the priest asks him, are, are you sure it's that, or is it possible that you actually like doing harm to these bad people, and, mm -hmm. and you're not ready to face that? And, and if I remember correctly, Matt Murdock really doesn't have an answer to that. Um, uh, he does. He doesn't like his answer, though. Yeah, that, that, <laughs> yeah. That, that's more accurate. Right. Yeah. So he, when, when the priest fires that at him, he's like, hmm, you got me. Maybe yeah. I do like this. And like that's part of the struggle is part of what humanizes that character actually is that you know he is getting some kind of of joy out of doing what he does because if you if something was making you miserable your entire existence even a hero wouldn't do it for forever unless their name is batman apparently right uh, <laughs> well and, and so i guess so here's the question i i think we can we can push on is you know okay i i am gonna feel there's a part of me that feels like you know socially exposing nazis is the good thing because you know Nazis are able to thrive in the shadows and, and like the, there is at least some degree to which being a Nazi is socially bad and so we should use that power. But I know there is also that part of me that just wants to see Nazis suffer because I 
I fucking hate Nazis. I, I, they hate me, you know? And, and, uh, and I'm right there with you, Matthew. Right. I also hate Nazis. No, yeah, I think all of our listeners are, to be sure. I'm not, I'm not claiming that as exclusive to me. Right. But, but, but is what, it okay? But what, is it okay to use that hate to drive our actions? Well, right. Or, or not even just is it okay, but how do we know when we're letting our hate, you know, talk us into a justification? Does, does right. that make sense? Well, Cause, cause what's interesting that's, that's exactly that question yeah, that Murdoch yeah, yeah, yeah. with. Well, what's interesting about that question, I feel, is that uh, the, in, in my opinion, the, the purpose, the, the purpose for doxing, why you would engage in in the practice of doxing, is to hold people socially accountable for things that our society has rejected, right? Right, for things that are not okay. And I would hope that that so like. If that practice is used in this case, right, and I use it again later, so if I if I were to go do this now and then I were to go do it again and it wasn't okay, uh, that somebody else in our same society would put me in check. Right. That they, they'd put me in my place through a similar means to hold me accountable for what I'm doing and why what I'm doing is not okay. Um, like, and clearly this is a tool that, that, and I want to make it clear that uh, if in case anybody who's listening wasn't aware of this, it's not just the people who are opposed to the to the the march the marchers in Charlottesville that have engaged in this. Uh, some of the some of the people who support uh, the Nazis, for lack of a better way to describe them, um, took the person who who took the video of the tragic event with the car and uh the right the... I, I have difficulty t- talking through this but, but but took that video found out all of that person's personal information uh a ton of it and wove a conspiracy theory to throw out to to deflect mm-hmm. uh so they're i mean they're using it doesn't mean we should but um it, it's it's not just on the it's not just on that side of the fight, and it is a fight. Yeah, and no, so oh, go on. Oh, because yeah, no, I, I, I'm, I think that is a really important point because, um, th- this is a tact. I, I think one of the reasons why a lot of folks really reject this tactic is because it is primarily used by people who we think of as the opponents of justice, by like the Nazi you're talking about, by mm-hmm. the, the the people attacking. The women talking about ethics in in, in journalism uh, and, and and video games and things like that, and, and, and here to me this is the Batman issue of you know Batman. I think this is Chris, Christopher Nolan would get this so right. Most people say like bad people use fear, so we shouldn't use fear. Batman's all about saying no, no. I'm going to use the nope. exact tactics they use, but use them mm-hmm. for a better way. Right, or for what he feels is correct. Right, right. What what he feels is right. Um. And so interestingly, when, when we look at who's deciding, you know, who is bad enough to be doxxed, who's, who's crossed that line where now it's okay to do this, um, we see our heroes making these decisions or some of our heroes making these kinds of decisions. We also see villains both in real life and in, in fiction making these decisions. And if we lived in a perfectly black and white world, we'd be able to say, okay, that's clearly wrong because they're bad. They're on the bad side, so what they're doing is wrong, and it's right when the good guys do it because they're on the good side of things. Right. But our world doesn't work that way. And it's it raises this question of is is effectively attacking somebody for their beliefs ever okay? Mm. Because this is still an attack. It's not the same kind of attack as like going up to them while they're marching and punching them in the face. Uh, or or spraying them in the face with a can of mace or anything like that, but but it's still an attack. I would argue it's a it's a more insidious one, uh, and possibly a more damaging one. Any kind of socialist you know perspective would say that you know attacking someone's job and their livelihood is is often a, a far more dangerous kind of attack than just yeah, punching them in the a, face. There's more long term consequences. The, the bruise from you punching them in the face will heal, right? I mean, unless you've knocked teeth out or something that they're going to be able to return to some semblance of normalcy afterward. But if you do long-term damage to their ability to get a job, that that's actually a, a more, uh, this is probably not the word I want to use, but if you know what I mean, effective attack 
mm-hmm. in insofar as if if it, the purpose of an attack is to cripple your opponent, right. then this does a much better job than any than than a lot of the physical things that you can do to them, uh, because there's a long term impact associated with it, and in that way, it's a more dangerous weapon. Yeah. Uh, to to shame people and to convince other uh, and to to throw that out in a public way so that others can see the shame and make decisions to continue to isolate this person, cut them off from their job, disown them from their family, etc. And, and that's one thing I think that that that's I think that would be part of why someone like a Superman or a Captain America would be so against this because they they are in that idea of like you know this is how you fight you know you throw a punch I'm going to throw a punch um, here even though although I think you're right. Mal would use the tactic. That's something even Mal, you know, Mal is a, you know, let's just punch each other. Let's not use all right. this kind of... Ma- Mal is, if I kill you, uh, you'll be staring me in the face and you'll be armed. Right. Right. He says that to uh, to the doctor, doctor in the first episode? Second and episode? I think it, so, early, yeah. early, it's early in the show. Um, just, and it gives you a, a clear in into his character where he's all like, I'm not going to do anything underhanded. Uh, I just don't think he would see... Uh, this kind of attack on anybody he sees as his enemies as underhanded. Well, and so let me push on on what you're just talking about because I think this is um th- this question of sort of like how bad does a person have to be to justify this, especially when what we're talking about is I, the line between attacking someone's beliefs and attacking their actions. Because because I, mm-hmm. I do think that like something like being at a Nazi rally is an it's not just a belief; it's an action. But, but for example, and I, I think in our world this is by no means a, a crazy idea, but if tomorrow we found out that Anonymous or someone from Anonymous had hacked into a Nazi mailing list, you know, just an, an email list of people who'd signed up for a, you know, uh, Holocaust-denying uh, newsletter, mm-hmm. and, they, and they released the information of all the people who were on that mailing list with the express purpose of saying these are bad people, they're part of something bad, they should suffer social stigma – and consequences. Do, are, are we still okay with that? Is that crossing a line from what happened about this rally? Where, where would you see something like that? I'm personally not okay with that. Mm-hmm. Uh, once you get to the point where you are so, – so the difference, in my opinion, is that the people who marched in Charlottesville chose to be public. They were taking a stand, and it, it, it was empowering for them to not hide themselves in any way. Right. Right. Whereas anonymity on the Internet is something that is usually implicit. Um, So to go dig that information up and then make that information public. Yeah, I I wouldn't be comfortable with that. That I feel crosses a line uh, that we shouldn't need to cross to have this fight. Yeah, I I, I think I think I'm with you. I think that's and, and that's the kind of thing where to me. I mean, one of the things that I think are that a lot, and this is something that even Batman does. Um, I, I think once I'm going to back up here and get a little bit philosophical, but I think this is sort of at the at the core of, of so many of the questions we're talking about. You know, when when you live by society's rules, one of the points of that is you sort of say the rules are what tells me that some things are okay and some things aren't. And and to some extent, what I think all of these heroes, if they're not named Superman or Captain America, or even like, if they're not named Superman, even Captain America does this. What so many of these heroes are dealing with is once you are willing to break some of society's rules because you think some of those rules are bad, what what stops you from just the pure anarchy of I'm going to hurt people who I don't like because that makes me feel good? You know, and I think this is where mm-hmm. because Batman is so easy, so quick to say the rules of the police are stupid, the rules of the society are stupid, I'm going to break all of them. For him, that rule of "I will not kill" has to be so ironclad, you know, because Correct. he has to have a strict rule for himself. He um, has to have a line he won't cross. It, Some iteration of Batman also refused to use guns because that's how his parents died. Right. Which I also find it very interesting when when they take that approach. Yeah, and I, I it always bothers me a little bit when when I, I mean I, I love the um the original um. Michael Keaton movie, but his use of the guns just so bothers yeah. me for that reason. Yeah. Um, but but I think that that to me is that is where like I, I feel like if if what we're gonna start by saying is that the law because here's the other thing that I think is is essential to a hero is that is so necessary to this discussion for me. I I feel like in a regular world, marching down the street, 
calling for violence against Jews and blacks and Mexicans and gays, that, that there should be legal action taken in that because that's not just speaking out publicly. It is incitement to violence. And, mm -hmm. and part of what we're talking about is what, like a lot of our heroes do, is you know, Batman – if the Gotham City Police Department were doing its job perfectly, Batman would not be Batman. Batman right. acts because the police aren't doing their job. And and to some extent, we're, all of what we're talking about is what do we do when when our you know when our government is is run by people who are supporting this instead of being against it. Um, and, and I guess to me, the reason why I keep coming to this is it, it seems that in that same way that Batman does, if we're going to start to say to ourselves, some things are okay, some things that would normally be socially prescribed are actually okay, we still have to figure out what is the if we're not going to hold to that line. We have to figure out what is the line yeah. for us. Yeah. And we should define it before we we get to it, yes. right? Because otherwise we'll cross it without even knowing it. And to me, the line is um, not going to do it just be, and, and this, this comes to an earlier point. The line is I'm not going to do it to somebody just because I don't agree with them personally. Right. Uh, and I'm not going to do it. Uh, I'm not going to release private information, but if they take public action, if, if it's something that, they they put themselves out there. I feel that those actions should have should and will have consequences. I feel it's incorrect for it not to have consequences in that case. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what's most important to me is that they are held accountable to that. But I'm not going to dig up their. I think dig, going to dig up private information about the person that they're not putting out there. That's crossing the line a bit. Well, but I mean, none of those people were walking down the street saying. My name is such and such. I work at this place, and my parents are here, and you can contact them this way. <clears throat> I mean, we their face was public, and their identity is findable. But we're still. I mean, we are doing some digging, even in, in what's happening. Right, but with there's, there's a right? difference between there's a difference between doing an image search and finding somebody's Facebook profile and saying, okay, this is who this is, right. and making sure people know who that is and calling that out, and then it's spreading via social media or what have you, versus going and finding out where they live. Right or using so, some internet detective or work to find, yeah, it's tough because yeah. in some ways that that helps you get the information to the people who you feel should have it for their own safety among other things. Like if you find out somebody lives in a one of these guys lives in a predominantly black neighborhood, hmm, that gets problematic too, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're like I'm I'm concerned for the safety of their neighborhood, but if I release that information. Did I just put that person in danger? And am I okay with that? Right. Or who else am I putting in danger in that kind of a way? Right. Um, right. And and I think that that's you know um in, in one of my former lives uh, one of my first careers was I I did union organizing, and I remember when when we were involved in public actions against um you know the the people who we were negotiating with in these union fights, um. That there was there was one particular guy who who we were trying to bring public pressure on, and so in in one uh, document that was passed around, uh, they listed his home phone number with a request to like call this person at all hours of the day, all hours of the night, to to put pressure and to harass him into you know not busting this union in a terrible way he was doing, and and yeah. I, rem I remember having some qualms about that, but also thinking I understood where that was coming from. But it's but, encouraging people to break the law right. to get what you want, and I think again that crosses the line. Well, and, and what I was going to say is where it went in that same fight. What then was to me a even further and a clearer wrong was they also then released information about where his kids went to school, wanting people to like go to his kids and say your dad and is doing something kids. terrible. Ugh. And to me, that's so clearly across the line. The phone number I think is across the line, but it's a lot. Like yeah. you said, it's a tough one. And, and in some ways, and this is what I – the heroes that I love, I don't know if they all ask – if they get to the same answer. But as you said before, they're at least asking the question. You know, And it's, right. it's – when I see the people I agree with talking about why this is a good thing, I, I, I generally agree with them. But I want to at least know we're asking these questions. Yeah, because if you don't – again, and like I said earlier, if you stop asking yourself the question, you're doing that thing where you assume – righteousness mm -hmm. on the part of your actions that is dangerous yeah. you just assume you're in the right and never question what you're doing when you're doing things that can cause people problems or harm then you need to take a, you need to take a step back and you need to 
start thinking again, because that's where you're going to go from somebody who's, you know, trying to do the right thing for the right reasons to somebody who thinks they're doing the right thing for the right reasons, but has convinced themselves that they are right and is going to uh, take actions that are that are past the point that they should. I don't have a better way to say that. That they're going to no, I yeah. Well, They're going to cross the line from morally gray to morally not okay. And, and to me, this is, I, I didn't even realize we were going to talk about Daredevil so much, but to me, the, probably the reason why I think he is the best villain I've seen in a comic book movie, um, Wilson Fisk. Um, the reason why mm-hmm. I think he is so powerful is I, I, you know, I think that even after he's been in jail, Kingpin Fisk is 100% convinced that he is the hero of his story. And yep. he is 100% convinced for very good reason. I mean, he had this incredibly traumatic childhood. He saw the damage that was done to his mother. He sees the damage that's done by society falling apart, particularly in the neighborhood of the city that he loves so much. And and he wants to protect it just as much as Matt Murdock does. I, I think one thing that, that Daredevil Season 1 is so brilliant at is how much it highlights. These are two men with the pretty much the exact same goal who are both willing to cross moral lines. I, I think, mm-hmm. I, I, as we're kind of getting at, Matt is willing to – Matt doubts his own righteousness in a way that Fisk doesn't. Correct. Um, and, and maybe I didn't even connect to this before, but I think maybe that's – the reason why I, I want us to dive into this question is because I agree with the people who are saying we should, we should do this to Nazis, but the righteousness but, scares me a little bit. Right. Does that make that, sense? That make, yeah, that makes you uncomfortable. And, and I totally agree that as soon as you – so, like, again, at the end of the day, I'm okay with it, but I don't – I don't immediately go, yeah, we're doing it, and and have just nothing but warm fuzzies. I'm, especially if somebody is is because because you can you can get into this dangerous scenario, especially if you're in an echo chamber, if you're just talking with people who who agree with you on ninety percent of of things that you talk about, you can get into this situation where you drum up your own uh, shared opinions to the point where now you you are convinced they're incontrovertible truth yeah, and that you are de facto righteous and there's never a point where you're not. And that has caused problems historically. So remember, <laughs> yeah. if anybody's going to learn from history, it should be the people who are not actually advocating for, uh, for the extermination of uh, various <laughs> and, and races, creeds, yeah. et cetera. Like, yeah, we what? we need to be the people who actually check ourselves before we. Right, you know, we we need to be not just Matt Murdock, but that priest who's asking Matt Murdock the hard yep. question. What, and we need to play the priest for our friends when they're doing that. What, right. And so let me ask the one other question that that someone asked me um, that I'm not sure I know the answer to, and I, I think you put so well that you know that one of the values of doing this is that when when our society can say pretty clearly you know, Nazism is wrong, then exposing people, there is, there is value in socially exposing the people who are breaking those social rules. And I, and I get that, and I'm so glad we have a society. I, I wish we had a society that even more of our society thought Nazism was wrong. Um, but we're not that far removed from a time when people would have spoken of, of homosexuality as just right. as wrong and needing to be socially exposed. And and we're right. we're still in a time when a lot of people see that even if not across the board. Um, so so what's the response there when someone would say, you know, yes, we all agree that Nazism is bad, but we've all agreed that some some things were bad that really shouldn't have been. Um, and, and, and so is that does that invalidate this to some extent? I think that you can. So I think that uh, we're capable of recognizing how that's not a real parallel right Mm -hmm. on the one half you have people advocating literally advocating violence as part of of their creed as part of their their slogan uh and on the other hand you have people saying hey i i want to love different types of people than you right i to me it's so obviously clear that they're not the same um i think you raise a good point though that um our society has has we've come a long way uh even since i was young Mm -hmm. Uh, i grew up in in the rural parts of america and was fed a lot of things that i've had to reject over the years as as ideas that 
you know, they didn't make sense. And when I finally like sat down and evaluated them, I went, yeah, you know, I, I just, I can't get behind this. Um, and I'm glad I did that. But at the same time, you, you can get indoctrinated into these ideas. So it's important to continue to, to be vigilant and to, uh, to have those evaluations, to take those moments and say, is this really wrong? Who is this harming is the right. first question I like to ask. Who's hurt by this? If my answer is nobody, then why do I care? Right. Right? And to me, this this passes and fails this test, respectively. Like, homosexuality, that hurts nobody. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, Nazism, yeah. They're saying let's hurt people. Clearly That's Nazism, not okay. Yeah. Right. It, it, it hurt people before. We have proof. Although some people deny that, that happened. And that's also problematic. Mm-hmm. And that also hurts people. So... And, and I, I think this is, I, I think that's an important distinction you're making. And I think even there, I, I don't think it is quite that black and white just because, I mean, you know, 100 years ago, 50 years ago, and in some parts of the world today, there are people who will tell you that homosexuality hurts people. Um, I 100% disagree with that. I completely reject that. And I think there's no scientific basis for that. But, you know, I, I, on a lot of these issues, it, it, it's easy for us to forget that from the other perspective, they will see it, it is doing just problem. as much harm. Yep. Yeah, and I, I, yep. I don't want to go into moral equivalency there. I think that that's the, the reason why I still probably do come down on the side of of, of doxing is because I don't think it's morally equivalent, and I do think doing this to Nazis is is I do see it as a fundamental difference between that versus doing it to expose something like uh, homosexuality. Um, but but I think we have to be careful to remember that what looks clearly black and white to us isn't going to look clearly black and white to other people. Right. Especially if they've been, uh, as I said, indoctrinated. That's very strong language, I understand. But but if they've been, uh, I'll back off on that. If they've been raised to believe a certain thing uh, and given a lot of, of supporting arguments for that thing, uh, it can be very difficult to explain to them uh, if you if you disagree that, no, this, this isn't actually hurting anybody. And there's some people who still to this day hold that belief i'm sure Mm -hmm. uh so it's a case where like we're not thankfully in this case we're not personally responsible for the social advancement of our society but i feel as long as we're in it's 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 good that we're asking the questions i feel as long as we continue to ask the questions and really challenge ourselves and our own assertions of is this really right um we might not be perfect we're probably still going to get some things wrong but at the end of the day at least we tried to find the the right path we tried to figure out where those where the lines are and maybe we move them and maybe we don't but it's very difficult especially when in talking in these nebulous terms it's very difficult to lay down a a strict well this is always going to be right and this is always going to be wrong that doesn't fail some kind of historical test right no, I, I think that's a really good point. I think that's, you know, tying it back, I think it's why my favorite hero stories are always going to be the ones who, who do involve a little more navel-gazing. Um, mm-hmm. and, I, and I say that term intentionally because I think there's a real danger of, you know, paraly- you know paralysis of analysis of, of getting so far into the navel-gazing that you're, you're never really willing to actually act. And, and this is, I know, the... The concern that people have with, with liberalism today and in the response to Nazism is that if we spend so much time, you know, asking ourselves, well, are we are we like the the people who doxed the the video game people if we do it ourselves, and mm-hmm. are we are we shutting down free speech? Like, th- there has to be a point at which you say there's evil in the world. Let's fight evil, and if I can't punch evil, I'm going to socially punch it. But but I but it but it's like anything. I think there's a middle ground because I think. Some of these questions, I think, are so Im- – they're important to ask even if I'm pretty sure what the answer is. Right, exactly. Um, it is interesting that uh, one of the heroes we talked about literally meditates and yet has done almost no navel-gazing. Uh, oh, Danny, Danny Rand? <laughs> Danny Rand, yeah. yeah. So that that just drives me up the wall. Uh, I don't know what he meditates on when he does it. <laughs> um, no, I, I think I think he meditates on apparently uh, port gyoza is what he <laughs> meditates on. Um, Which, by the way, and I, I I'll, uh, as a shout out to Paul, I know, uh, and this is getting wildly off topic, but but Rally, we're supposed but, to be vegetarian. Yeah, mm-hmm. and, and yeah. I mean, in terms of like that, that is one demographic. I'm not a vegetarian myself, but but Paul is a vegan and often talks about how mm-hmm. that is one. Um, um, 
demographic that is criminally underrepresented in, in these stories. Um, and so I, I, on his behalf, if nothing else, I was disappointed that we don't even get that from Danny Rand. Um, yeah, no, and I agree. But, um, but I think you're you brought right. up a oh, go ahead. You brought up a thing that that I wanted to make sure we talked about uh, with with the free speech angle, actually. Um, spe- uh, talking more about the news, the uh, the thing where um, many many websites actually, uh, Facebook, Google, Reddit, among them, um, but others as well, decided that they were going to remove white supremacist, all right, neo Nazi, KKK groups uh, in response to. Uh, the events of Charlottesville, and they they did that, and and that in that case, that kind of censure, that kind of sanctioning, uh, I've heard and read material of people saying that's that's no longer okay because now you're violating their free speech. I want to push against that a bit though, because there's nothing that's saying people can't say what they want to say, but again, your your actions have consequences, so. We, we should always question when that happens, too, because what we wouldn't want to happen is if, if there was a, a, a gay rights uh, group, for example, on Facebook that uh, and Facebook suddenly decided to shut them down. We wouldn't be OK with that. Right. Because we right. agree with with them. We agree with the agenda they're trying to push. Um, so, again, that's another situation where we have to really ask ourselves every time, why is it OK this time? Yeah, I think that's a really good point, because I definitely think that. Uh, for, first of all, as you said, and this is something that, you know, um, we were talking before about how being a superhero often means you're 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 accepting that the the, the official governmental methods are not working, and so you're going to take some other action. Um, the right to free speech, at least in our constitution, is one guaranteed by the government. It's not. There is nothing saying that private institutions have to protect that right. And and mm-hmm. so I think there's a, a certain, as you pointed out, just a certain speciousness to those arguments. But 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 there again, you know, if if it's again a question of if Facebook and Google are going to say we're not going to draw the line the way the government draws, we still do have to ask how are they drawing that line? Because right. you know, there's an extent to which I think supporting Donald Trump to me is pretty much tantamount to white supremacy and Nazism at this point in time. That being said, if Facebook were to ban people from supporting Donald Trump. I would be outraged. I think that's going way too far in a way that them banning the Daily Stormer, the Nazi newspaper, is something yep. I agree with. You know, And I think it's that um, – uh, and this is something I know not to get us way off into a tangent, but that you and I uh, as both judges in the magic community, in the magic gathering community, often talk about in terms of you know, that's a space where we're both dedicated to creating a safe space where you're not allowed to you – know, I think you and I would both agree if someone came in wearing a swastika – uh, we would probably say you're not welcome at our event. Um, the, uh, there's there's no probably about it. This yeah. happened at oh. GP Indy. Oh, Somebody really? Somebody came in with, and they sent him. They they said, you know, turn your shirt around. Day one came in. They said, no, you've got a blank. You've got to cover that up. You can't have that on the tournament floor. They caught him before he even sat down for a match. He showed up the next day with, I think, an armband or something like that. I might be getting the story wrong, but I just heard about it today. Uh-huh. Uh, and they sent him away. They said, nope, you're not allowed in the hall. They alerted security. It's Good. like, we, we can't have that. And, yeah, I think that's exactly the appropriate action. And But, but at the same time, I think I – as much as I think Trump is coming close to that, I think – am I right? We would both agree – Wearing a Make America Great hat to a magic event would, would make me cringe, but but I can't I can't say that that person's not welcome. Right. There's a, there's at least a degree of separation right. between uh, Trump support and support of alt right fascist white supremacists etc. Um, and so in that way, like not every Trump's not everybody who voted for Trump is one of those people. Well, and it, it's just funny because the I, I know exactly what you mean, and I'm not I'm not attacking you here because I would do the same thing. But I think to me, one of one of my biggest concerns I would often have about the right or Nazis or things like that is the use of phrases like those people. Um, and I think it's it, 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 what what you just said. I think is a great example of, of just the danger that we're all having of like you know how no, easy you're absolutely it right. That the phrase "those people" like can people be itself very people. problematic if we start thinking of things in terms of here's a class of people that we're not. That we're not okay well, with. And, and here's where I get back to this idea. Because I, I, like I said, I, 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 there's a reason why I, I, I push back a little bit on that phrase. But it's also – it is an appropriate phrase in this kind of setting. And it's uh, – to tying it back to the larger questions, 
I, I feel like there's a real danger in taking the perspective of, well, the bad people, and, and that, that phrase being kind of in quotes to begin with, but, you know, the Nazis, the racists, whoever they are, they use this tactic, so therefore we shouldn't. Um, I think that that's it's, – it's to me, again, one of the things that Mal people like Malcolm Reynolds and Batman, I think, do such a good job of highlighting the problems with that kind of philosophy is that at the end of the day, these things are tools, you know, even something like violence. I, I used to think of myself as 100 percent pacifist, nonviolent, um, until I realized that even violence is to some extent a tool. And we live in a society where we are actually pretty happy that violence is used in some ways. Um, my, my, I had a professor who really pushed me on this in grad school who used to love to talk about that uh, Martin Luther King, who I always think of as like a hero of a paragon of nonviolence, that Martin Luther King, he talked about nonviolence in terms of tactics of non-governmental actors. But at the end of the day, what, he, what, what Martin Luther King wanted was for the federal government to send men with guns to force the, uh, you know, segregate the desegregation of schools or the desegregation of, mm -hmm. of buses or whatever. He wanted the, you know, the president to use the National Guard to do things. That that's an inherently a violent act. Um, Martin Luther King recognized mm -hmm. that, but th there was a way in which he wanted the threat of right. Violence, I guess at least there, there's a distinction a tool, I feel between strong arming and actually ways. doing violence. Right. Uh, like if I show up in a tank and tell you you have to do something unless i'm firing the tank eh, i'm i'm threatening mm -hmm. but i'm not actually doing violence um see i i personally still identify uh very much as a pacifist mm -hmm. um and i don't enjoy the i don't enjoy entertaining the idea of using violence as a tool to to fight any battle right but it's like I'm. I have, I have a benefit of being in a position that I don't have to think about that. Mm -hmm. I don't have to deal with that um, most often in my life, and I, I feel like it, there are cases where I would resort to it. I was just thinking about uh, it was a dream I had last night where I was like, "Yeah, if that happened, I would resort to violence." So even I would cross lines. Well, I think there, and, and here I think this is a, a point we can definitely get into in a, a much deeper discussion. And I, I, I realize I kind of threw a, a, a big bomb into the center of the room with the Martin Luther King thing. <laughs> it's, a, it's something we could discuss for ages. But like, talk about being violent, throwing bombs. Exactly. <laughs> I, I, I got halfway through that sentence and realized this is a terrible metaphor to use. But you know, we said earlier that taking away a person's job, you know, attacking someone's job, attacking their livelihood is a very violent act in that way. You know, I think that that. It's a certainly a very damaging act, and I think that that um, we we I, I think it's important to distinguish: Are we talking specifically about violence as, in terms of physical things? For, yeah. And, and but even so, the, the the larger point I was just trying to make is that at the end of the day, these are still tools we're talking about, you know. And right. and and uh, we can have larger discussions about when these tools should or shouldn't be used, but but that at least I think we're in agreement that having a blanket idea of the other side uses one of these tools, so therefore we shouldn't, like, the, that, that that's problematic. We at least have to go deeper than just saying right. they use it, so we shouldn't. I mean, the other side using these tools is an attempt to use social pressure in some ways, uh, which is the same thing that we would be trying to do. Uh, the difference is that we're using social pressure to try to get them to align with uh, what society has deemed access acceptable, and they're using it to try to push against that yeah i th this is going to tie tie us into a totally new product uh, uh into an, a totally new um content but i think it's a it's a good kind of wrapping up thing um but have you you've seen the movie logan i have not seen the movie logan i i heard re listened to the episode that you re recorded on logan but i didn't hear okay it, well or i didn't watch the movie it, it's a fantastic movie definitely see it when you can and, and this is a little this is a little bit of the point that we make that we go into much uh more detail on that episode check the episode out. it's a great one for anyone who's listening but but to me what i think i love so much about that movie is it it, it really challenges the idea that a lot of people think of of you know that violence is dirty and wrong when it's used against you know for by bad people for bad reasons but that it's you know that that when captain america is beating up the bad guys that is artistic and beautiful um in the movie logan wolverine is using violence for the best of reasons to protect a small child to to protect other innocents and the violence is gruesome and terrible and awful um and and it's to me it's it's another great example of this idea of 
you know, we, whatever decision we're making about the use of tactics such as doxing or whatever, trying to judge it based on like, does it look like a good tactic? You know, that, that the, or telling ourselves that the tactic is going to look better if it's done for good reasons, that, that, that there's a real da danger there. We have to be careful about, you know, acknowledging that this is a terrible thing we're doing. And sometimes it might be for good reasons. It might be for bad reasons. But, but the, the, reason, the reason might justify it, but that doesn't clean it up, if that makes sense. Right, right. We're talking about using a tool that is, in a lot of ways, despicable to use, but we're using it to achieve an end that we feel is just. Again, there's problems with that, but uh, at the end of the day, I think in this case, it, it ends up doing good. Yeah. I I think that's where I am too, um, but this is why I'm so glad we're talking these questions. It's it's yeah. If, if we didn't talk about it, if we didn't wrestle with it, uh, that would be a problem. Yeah. So so I think that that's kind of a good wrapping up point. Is there any sort of last uh, questions or points on this topic you wanted to make sure we got into? Well, I think we I think we got into uh, basically everything that we wanted to talk about. Uh, we didn't actually talk too much about um why how the phantasm chose to to do it is bad and, and how that illustrates that uh when it's somebody else who's deciding who's in the wrong or who who needs this treatment uh suddenly it, it's no longer okay because we don't agree with them but we talked we, i guess we talked some about that so i think i think yeah. we're at a good spot i, I think we I, I guess i there i guess there's one point there is that we talked about how one of the things that the the mask of the phantasm and also arrow highlights is the danger of allowing like just the, the visceral part of you that wants to see bad things happen to bad people take over. But, mm -hmm. but the other thing is, and, I, and this is maybe a whole other topic we can dive into in a later show. To me, I think the other thing that really comes that I think is important is who are you accountable to? You know, Matt Murdoch is accountable to his priest. He has someone who he's checking in with. Um, and to his friends. And, uh, he's accountable to Foggy and to, uh, I keep wanting to call her Jessica, and it's because she was Jessica on True Blood. Yes, I, I know who you're yes. – I, I will edit in later us getting her name right, I'm sure. Cause I, 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 Fantastic, because like for whatever reason I'm blanking on her name because I didn't see Daredevil, an actual Daredevil show in a while, and right. I don't think they've used her name uh, and, and, and I think this season. In some ways I would say that actually, yeah, one of the interesting things about the, the Daredevil story, at least in the uh, – uh, especially in the Defenders, but also in season two of, of Daredevil – is it a greedy which he's sort of breaking out of his accountability? But, you know, but that... Oh, Karen. Karen, thank you. It's Karen Page. Karen that's Page, who that's it, it is. Wherever. But, yeah. I'm, and I feel terrible because I love that <laughs> character. And it was like, why can't I think of her name? But, you know, the, the Avengers are all, to some extent, accountable to each other. You know, I think that this is where Batman, even, is accountable to Alfred. Um, I, I think maybe that's the other thing that, that the Phantasm is missing. Uh, and that in, in in the parts of it where it really goes off the rails, characters like Oliver Queen are, 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 are what they're missing is they're not they're not accountable to someone else. Um, and I guess maybe that's that's where I come down on more than anything is with, with if we're going to start using ta tactics like doxing and the like, we we need to be having these conversations with each other because we need to be accountable to each other. You know, someone right. someone else on the left needs to be looking at groups like Antifa and Anonymous and saying. Okay, I, I I totally get your methods. I totally get your reasons. I totally get your goals. Let's talk about your methods. Are they always good or are they always bad? Are they problematic? Because um, mm -hmm. that's at the end of the day, I think the things that the heroes I support have and and the ones that that don't, I really have concerns about is is that degree of accountability to someone else. I think it's a good way to sum it up. Mm -hmm. I got nothing else. <laughs> no, it's good. I think I think it's definitely <laughs> a good ending point. Well, so so Jacob and I are kind of out of thoughts on this topic, but but what about you guys? Um. This is obviously a deep topic that gets into a lot of political stuff, and it gets into a lot of superhero stuff. Um, I also should be uh, – what do you think about it? You can tweet at us. You can find us on Facebook. Um, you can post things directly on the page where this website goes up, where the uh, podcast goes up, uh, Superhero Ethics on Twitter or Facebook. Let us know what you think. Um, let us know what you think. Which heroes would, would or wouldn't use these tactics? Uh, let us know what you think of these tactics and if you think we're wrong or you think we're right or you think there's questions we're not asking. Um, I should say I, I, we always want this podcast to be accessible to everybody um, on, on this topic. Uh, Jacob and I, like, like most of the other guests I've met, are pretty much on the political left. Um, but if someone um, views this topic uh, is, is on a totally different side of politics but still has some thoughts about superheroes and how they would or wouldn't use this topic, let us know. Uh, I definitely want to hear from you. 
I think I'm not going to hide my political views as we talk about this, but I still want the conversation to be open to everyone. And Jacob, I think you, you would probably say the same. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. Uh, I think as soon as you start uh, denying conversation, uh, de denying the ability to, to debate these things, uh, again, just you end up in, in an echo chamber and you, you don't expose yourself to outside ideas and you don't expose yourself to the possibility that you could be wrong on something. And that's what uh, creates these situations where people think that being gay is somehow wrong. Yeah, no, totally. I think, and, that, and that's at the end of the day, I think that's that's the biggest thing we're talking about is how do we get other voices into these conversations. So, yep. yeah, if if you got thoughts on it, please let us know. We'd love to hear from you. Um, thank you guys all for listening, Jacob. Thanks for being a part of this. Uh, have a great day. Bye bye.